So maternal collapse, uh, it is basically an acute event involving the cardiorespiratory system and the CNS resulting in reduced, so it involves two systems, CVS and CNS, resulting in reduced consciousness or absent consciousness level and potentially cardiac arrest and death. And this duration is in, important. So maternal collapse, when do you say? If it occurs, if this uh, reduced or absent consciousness uh, occurs during the pregnancy and up to six weeks after birth. Okay, so this is important. Then what are the most common causes? Most common causes for collapse are vasovagal attacks, epileptic seizures, and hemorrhage. Okay, so these are the three most common causes of collapse. Then what are the other causes? So we have four H and four T to remember the causes. H, the first H stands for hypovolemia, which could be because of any reason like hemorrhage, bleeding, in uh, spine, then spinal neurological or septic shock. Then second edge is hypoxia. So hypoxia is generally because of the cardiac conditions like uh, peripartum ca cardiomyopathy, myocardial infarction, aortic dissection, large vessel aneurysm. And in fact, this is a important recall question. So overall or most common in that there are two types of causes of maternal death which we will also be studying when we'll be talking about maternal death in future classes so there are direct causes and there are indirect causes direct causes are the ones which are related to the pregnancy so that has occurred like preeclampsia thromboembolism so these are direct causes and indirect causes are the ones which were already existent in the patient but they have aggravated in the pregnancy so like this cardiac disease iron deficiency anemia or any neurological disease, asthma. So these are indirect causes. Okay, understood. Yes, ma'am. So most common indirect cause is cardiac disease, and most common direct cause is thromboembolism. These two things you should remember. These are the causes of maternal death. Most common causes of maternal death, and most common causes of collapse. I've told you they're either vasovagal attacks, epilepsy, or hemorrhage. So these are the three most common causes of collapse. Then other things include hypo or hyperkalemia, hyponatremia. So uh, hyponatremia particularly occurs when you're using uh, oxytocin because it causes dilutional hyponatremia. Hypothermia, which is because we have uh, good temperature control in the ward, so it is very unlikely. Then other causes include the four T's, which include thromboembolism, which is the most common direct cause of maternal death. It could be because of amniotic fluid embolus, pulmonary embolus, air embolus, or myocardial infarction. Then it could be because of the toxicity. Toxicity could be because of, it could be local anesthetic toxicity, magnesium toxicity, tension pneumothorax following uh, trauma or suicide attempts. Then tamponade following trauma, again, trauma and suicide uh, attempts, then eclampsia and preeclampsia, which includes intracranial hemorrhage and uh, the characteristic of eclampsia and epilepsy both is collapse plus fitting. Uh, the patient throws fits. Okay. So incidences, various causes of maternal collapse. So uh, as you can see here, hemorrhage is the most common cause with an incidence of around six in 1,000 pregnancies. Other causes include cardiac arrest. The incidence is one in 36,000 maternities. Amniotic fluid embolism it is even more rare, one in 1.7 per one lakh maternities. Severe perioperative obstetric anaphylaxis with an incidence of one between one and 3.5 per one lakh. Uh, then this question, I've already told you if you want to attempt it. Hello, are you people with me? Embridge. Yeah, so Embridge. Is, Embridge is the most common cause of maternal Then a most common cause of maternal death. Direct causes uh, thromboembolism. Overall. Yeah, overall also it is cardiac disease. I told you most common overall and indirect cause is cardiac disease. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Then how do you identify that the woman is going into collapse? So you, uh, this chart you can get in your question also. They can give you a scenario and they can ask you the patient's temperature is this, blood pressure is this, pulse is this, and they will give you the chart. You don't 
you have to memorize it and you will have to calculate a mu score so mu uh, it is modified early obstetric warning score so based on the score you get they ask you what will you do next so this is how the questions have been asked both in part 2 and part 3 so this is important so uh, if you get the score based on your clinical scenario the score is between 1 and 3 what will you do here in this case you will just inform the registered midwife because the score is low you just inform the registered ward registered midwife and uh, he she will review the patient again and if uh, any immediate concern is there then medical review should be done and if there are no uh, no clinical concern, concerns then she uh, then a repeat assessment should be done between 30, uh, within 30 to 60 minutes and even after 30 to 60 minutes if the score remains the same so then you uh, request the tier 1 doctor or sho which is the lowest uh, level doctor to visit and review the patient within 30 minutes so this you should remember if the score is low between 1 to 3 only registered midwife will review and then she will uh, see if there is any concern or if the score remains the same within 30 to 60 minutes then she will ask the tier 1 doctor or sho to come and review the patient understood yes ma'am if the score is more than equal to 3 or 3 in any parameter any of these is there then you have to think of sepsis in that case first the ward registered midwife or ward coordinator should be informed and the, the ward coordinator must review the patient and she should ask immediately she should ask in this case she will wait for 30 to 60 minutes or if there are there is deteriorating or uh, score or clinical concerns are there then only she was informing the tier 1 doctor so here she will uh, if the score is more than equal to 4 or 3 she will immediately inform the tier 1 doctor or sho to review the patient within 30 minutes if tier 1 doctor or sho is unable to attend then obstetric registrar st3 to st5 or senior registrar st6 to st7 should come and review and one early observation should be made you should do a urine analysis and commence fetal monitoring if it is an antenatal patient then if the mu score is more than equal to 6 then what you have to do then the re registered midwife they have to co contact the senior people they have to contact uh, here tier 1 doctor is not informed directly obstetric registrar that is st3 to st5 or senior registrar and anesthetic registrar they have to uh, they have to come and review the patient on urgent basis so here uh, and they have to attend within 30 minutes So you they you will send an urgent review for these all the three uh, doctors obstetric registrar senior registrar and anesthetic registrar if the doctors are unable to attend if any, or any of these are unable to attend then consultant obstetrician on call and fourth on call anesthetist should come and attend the patient doctors to review and record management plan in the notes and in case uh, they if they recognize it as an emergency they have to co uh, contact recognize and respond team the number is 4 times 4 if uh, this was about mu score more than equal to 6 if however the patient is deteriorating further or fails to respond to the treatment that has been given then you have to seek an expul ex Uh, expert help then urgently you have to call the consultant obstetric consultant and anesthetic consult uh, obstetric anesthetist and if there is an emergency then you have to call uh, four times two and uh, state the emergency and ask the obstetric emergency team also to come and if the fetus is also compromised then you have to also contact neonatal emergency team okay so this is the next thing is just the same if the help is needed urgently if the patient's condition continues to deteriorate then you have to call emergency uh, which is four times two cardiac arrest call if critical care medical team review uh, required then you have to call this number 0012 so these are the numbers you, you should remember and this kind of questions can be asked in your school uh, uh in your exam so you should know uh, you don't have to remember this chart but you have to remember that if the score is this what to do if the score is this what to do so this much you should remember okay then there is a question if you people would like to take up symphysis pubis dysfunction what 
Symphysis pubis dysfunction means? CPD, no? CPD, hmm? That is not even in the option. No, no, no. no, no. no. We are discussing only the question. Okay, okay. Amniotic fluid embolism, ma'am. Yes, very good. It is amniotic fluid embolism. So in this, the patient has uterine hyperstimulation. The symptoms set in after she has been delivered by cesarean section, and she has symptoms of shortness of breath, and she is cyanotic. Her pulse rate is this. So basically, amniotic fluid embolism it sets in after delivery, and the patient has respiratory distress, and this. By characteristic bilateral ground glass appearance with impaired coagulation profile. So this is how the X-ray of amniotic fluid embolism looks like. So what is amniotic fluid embolism? The incidence of it is 1.7 per 1 lakh maternities, which is quite low, and paternal mortality rate in these cases is 67 per thousand total births. Why does it occur? It occurs due to complement activation. And the diagnosis is clinical based on the clinical findings. Uh, clinical findings will be the patient collapses during labor or birth, usually within 30 minutes of birth, in the form of acute hypotension, respiratory distress, and acute hypoxia. There might be profound fetal distress, seizures, and cardiac arrest. So these are the symptoms which can present. Ma'am, ma how is it seizures occurs, ma'am? Because of the hypoxia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then what are, there are various phases of amniotic fluid embolism. So initially, pulmonary hypo, hypertension develops because these uh, amniotic fluid embolus, they go to the lungs, to the circulation. So which may develop secondary to the vascular occlusion, either by debris or vasoconstriction. This often resolves. However, if it fails to resolve, then it results in left ventricular dysfunction or failure. Then in later stages, coagulopathy develops often giving rise to massive PPH. These are the phases. Then how do you manage these patients? So the treatment here is supportive rather than specific as there is no effective therapy. You have to involve early um, the experience, uh, senior experienced staff, including obstetrician, anesthetist, metallurgist, intensivist, uh, is essential to optimize the outcome. If the, if the patient is undelivered, if it is during labor, then delivery of the fetus and placenta should be performed as soon as possible. Coagulopathy needs early aggressive treatment, so you have to give them FFP. Recombinant factor 7 should only be used in the patients with amniotic fluid embolism when hemorrhage cannot be stopped by massive blood, uh, comp uh, blood component replacement. Okay, so this was about the amniotic fluid embolism and management. Then this question... If any idea anybody wants to guess what is the answer. No, I don't have idea. No idea. Okay, so the answer here is D. Intralip you give for local anesthetic toxicity, you give intralipid 20%. You have to remember this value, value because it's an important recall question. To give 20% intralipid IV bolus at 1.5 ml per kg over one minute. So local anesthetic toxicity. So most common drug associated with toxicity in pregnant females is local anesthetic. So how does the patient present? Initially, the patient uh, presents with feeling of inaberration and lightheadedness followed by sedation, circumoral paresthesia and twitching, which is a characteristic uh, symptom. Then in cases of severe toxicity, the patient can present with tonic-clonic convulsions, sudden loss of consciousness, cardiovascular collapse, sinus bradycardia, conduction blocks, pace stall and ventricular tachyarrhythmia. How do you manage these patients? You will stop the local anesthetic immediately. You will give them lipid rescue. What do you give? You give intralipid 
all the cases of lipid rescue should be reported to nhs improvement and lipid rescue site and uh, because it can result in arrhythmia as well you have to manage the arrhythmia accordingly then this is how this is the protocol for giving intralipid so initially you give a bolus of 20% intralipid 1.5 ml per kg over 1 minute so you give if it if the woman is weighing 70 more than 70 kg then you give uh, 100 ml according to the stools then if intravenous uh, then after that you give uh, this was a bolus dose then you give a maintenance dose so you give an infusion of 20% at a rate of 15 ml per kg per hour the bolus injection can be repeated twice at 5 minute interval if an adequate circulation has not been restored after another 5 minutes the infusion rate should be increased to 30 ml per kg per hour if an adequate circulation has not been restored do not exceed a maximum cumulative dose of 12 ml per kg that is 840 ml for a woman weighing 70 kg so this should be the maximum dose it should not exceed that so this bolus dose at least you should remember okay then uh, about uh, this was about uh, local anesthetic toxicity then there can be especially in the patients of eclampsia where you are giving magnesium sulfate there can be magnesium sulfate toxicity so the antidote for calcium uh, magnesium sulfate this is also one of the recall question what is what do you give you give 10 ml 10% calcium gluconate or 10 ml 10% calcium chloride by slow iv injection okay then uh, about anaphylaxis so incidence of severe perioperative obstetric uh, anaphylaxis is one uh, between 1 and 3.5 per 1 lakh uh, patients with a mortality rate of around 1% so this is again one of the questions so for anaphylaxis what tests do you perform so they also ask you like mast cell triptase is performed to diagnose what condition so this you should remember you have to do this test you don't have to learn about the details of it just remember the name because it has been asked and uh, you have to take three samples as a minimum one sample at 1 to 2 hours after the start of uh, symptoms should be taken ideally you have to take at least minimum one sample you should take but ideally three times the sample should be taken and when should you take these one is as soon as possible after the resuscitation has started second sample one, uh, second sample 1 to 2 hours after the start of the symptoms and third sample 24 hours later so three samples you have to take then uh, management of anaphylaxis so all potential causative agents should be removed you have to do initial resuscitation in the form of abcde ensure airway breathing circulation disability and exposure and environment then the treatment for treatment what do you give you give one in 1000 that is 500 microgram or 0.5 ml adrenaline or uh, intramuscularly so this you have to give intramuscularly only not iv and adrenaline can be repeated after 5 minutes if there is no effect in experienced hand you can also give 50 microgram bolus or 0.5 ml of one in 10000 solution which can be titrated intravenously so the dose for uh, this thing iv is much less and that also in experienced hands if you are anesthetist and all otherwise ideally you have to give it intramuscularly only then adjuvant therapy consists of chlorpheniramine 10 mg and hydrocortisone 200 mg both are given intramuscularly or by slow iv infusion this is how you manage a case of anaphylaxis then coming over to cardiac causes of maternal mortality so cardiac causes the main cardiac causes are ischemia and sudden mi and sudden arrhythmic cardiac death other causes include aortic root dissection which can be associated with inherited aortopathy like ehlerdon danlos syndrome or marfan syndrome so this is also one of the recall question they can give you this uh, scenario that the patient presents with central chest or interscapular pain and there is wide pulse pressure mainly secondary to systolic hypertension and a new onset cardiac murmur so this is characteristic central chest pain or interscapular chest pain so this is characteristic of aortic root dissection you have to remember this 
Then other causes include congenital and rheumatic heart disease, acute left ventricular failure, pulmonary edema, dissection of coronary aorta, infective endocarditis, and cardiomyopathy. So these are the cardiac causes of maternal mortality. Then coming over to obstetric sepsis. So most common organisms which are implicated in obstetric sepsis are streptococcal A, uh, group A, B, and D. Other organisms are pneumococcus E. coli. So we have a sepsis 6 bundle. So according to it, within 6 hours, you have to do some set of things. So if the patient, you uh, uh, recognize the patient of sepsis, what all things you have to do? This table is very, very important. Multiple times has been asked. Questions have been asked on that. So first, within 6 hours, you have to send serum lactate. Blood cultures and culture swabs should be uh, obtained prior to giving antibiotic. You have to give, you have to start uh, broad spectrum antibiotics and this has to be started within the first hour. Antibiotics, you have to start within the first hour. You have to, before starting antibiotics, you have to send blood culture and swabs and you also have to obtain lactate within at least six, uh, like within six hours. And in case the patient has severe hypotension or the lactate level is more than four, you have to remember this value, lactate level more than four. What you have to do, you have to give crystalloid, uh, rapid administration of crystalloid, minimum of 30 ml uh, per kg to be completed within three hours of diagnosis. Once adequate volume replacement has been achieved, then you have to give a vasopressor like noradrenaline with vasopressin or adrenaline in addition if required and or an inotrope, for example, dobutamine may be used to maintain the mean arterial pressure of more than 65 millimeter of mercury. Okay, so these are the things you have to do. Within one hour, you have to start broad spectrum antibiotics. Before broad spectrum antibiotics, you have to uh, uh, send blood cultures and swabs. You have to send serum lactate. Then uh, further management in an event of hypotension, if despite if the hypotension is there, despite fluid resuscitation, you've given fluid res resuscitation, that is patient has septic shock, or still the lactate is given resuscitation, but the lactate level is more than four. So this, they ask you a question, what lactate level indicates sepsis? So it is more than four millimole per liter. Then you have to, what you have to do, you have to consider dynamic variables for fluid status. Like you have to uh, do for measuring the cardiac, uh, uh, you, rather than blood pressure and the pulse rate and saturation, you have to do ad advanced monitoring using transesophageal Doppler and lithium dilution cardiac output monitoring. These are preferred to static variables like CVP or pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. And the use of CPP alone to guide fluid resuscitation can lo no longer be justified. Then you have to do, uh, you can consider steroids in these cases if the patient is unresponsive to adequate fluid resuscitation and vasopressor therapy. These targets are important. You have to maintain an oxygen saturation more than 94% and if the hemoglobin in cases of septic shock, if it is less, this criteria is also important, then will you transfuse if the hemoglobin is less than 7 gram per liter. Okay, 7 gram per deciliter, sorry. Understood? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Then uh, about generalized management of maternal collapse. So you have to uh, first approaches uh, you have to do a b c d e that is airway manage the airway assess the breathing assess the circulation assess for any dis uh, disability disability you assess in the form of a b p u that is uh, whether the uh, patient is alert and conscious a stands for alert and conscious b she responds to voice p if she responds to uh, pain u is patient is completely unresponsive so this is how you assess for disability and exposure. You uh, like you expose the patient's uh, chest and to look for the uh, uh, movement of the chest and whether the patient is breathing. You uh, secure the environment. So all this come in exposure. So the patient should be uh, placed in left lateral position. Breathing and carotid pulse should be assessed first. And AVPU response should be assessed should be under, uh, undertaken as an alternation as an alteration to of consciousness can be a sign of critical illness you, uh, if the patient is preg uh, pregnant you have to assess for the fetal well-being which you do only after stabilizing the mother after doing abcde then only you assess for the fetal well-being that comes the last so mother is always the priority in cases of maternal collapse
then this is how you manage you ensure a safe environment you uh, stimulate the patient you uh, you try to move the patient that are you awake and if the patient is uh, responsive to the stimulus and she responds then what you do you, you ensure manual displacement of the uh, you okay i'll just repeat this maternal collapse algorithm once again so first you ensure a safe environment you stimulate the patient uh, you uh, ask her whether she is conscious and whether she is awake what is her name and you assess the response if she is responsive then you ensure manual uh, uterine displacement or left lateral tilt and you call the uh, call for help so what happens when you displace the uterus why uh, one of the reason for uh, this collapse is aortic compression so you, as the size of the uterus increases it compresses the major vessels aorta and then it uh, uh, decreases the um, also it decreases uh, like the uh, it decreases the cardiac output and that is the reason so when you displace the uterus so that compression is relieved or you are when you ask the patient to lie on left lateral position that compression is relieved so that's what that's what you do you call the patient for uh, call uh, for help you assess breathing pulse rate blood pressure and fetal heart rate uh, regularly assess using news chart identify the cause of co uh, collapse and accordingly you treat this is when the patient is responsive if the patient is not responsive then what you do you shout for help and call the resuscitation team so a first step is always you call for help then you assess then comes a b c d e you assess for airway so you see if there is any obstruction so you do head tilt three things you do head tilt chin lift and jaw thrust so this will open the airway and then uh, after opening the airway you assess for breathing and for how long do you assess only 10 seconds so uh, look and how do you assess for breathing you look uh, you look listen and feel you look for the chest movements you listen the breath sounds and you feel the uh, feel for the air coming out through the nostrils so this is how you assess breathing if you see that the patient is breathing normally then turn her into recover position check uh help uh, check that help is on the way assess again you assess the breathing pulse rate blood pressure uh, fetal heart rate regularly assess using news chart identify the cause of collapse and direct treatment so this remains the same then if the patient is not breathing then you have to start cpr immediately and ensure man manual uh, uterine displacement or left lateral tilt then uh, you should go for if the patient is not uh, responding there is no breathing and uh, after assessing breathing also patient is you should consider for early intubation and the airway uh, why early intubation because the air, uh, airway in pregnancy is more vulnerable because of increased risk of regurgitation and aspiration so because this because of the progesterone there is uh, this upper esophageal sphincter is very lax so there is chances of contents to aspirate so that's why you have to consider for intubation and they also ask the specifically what kind of tube will you use so you use cuffed uh, uh, endotracheal tube for intubation you do not use non cuff and you do not use supraglottic devices because they do not protect against uh, aspiration so you use cuffed uh, um, cuffed tube for intubation and then in case intubation fails then you try to with bag and mask only you try to maintain the oxygen you call for help then you can think of supraglottic devices or tracheostomy that is front of neck excess okay and in, in case of, while you are assessing breathing if it is gasping or agonal breathing it doesn't mean that the patient is uh, uh, fine it it is a sign of dying rather than uh, life so gasping is not a good sign okay then or uh, you start uh, like if the, there is no breathing you immediately start cpr so this is also another question they ask you what is the rate of cpr in adults and children so neonates i'll be telling you later so in adults the rate is 30 compression and 2 ventilation so the rate is 30 is to 2 okay 30 compressions you have to and this is in the initial phase when you are doing that, uh, one person is doing chest compression and other person is giving breaths so then they give uh, 30 compression and after completing 30 compression the other person gives two breaths so that is when then 
are post intubation post intubation when the ventilator is giving breaths at a fixed rate okay that time you have to do a continuous chest compression at a rate of 100 per minute so that is desynchronized when the patient is intubated so these two things you have to remember like if the patient is not intubated when you are doing bag and mask then the rate of compression to ventilation is 30 is to 2 when once the patient is intubated it becomes desynchronized then the intub uh, like the intubator will be giving the oxygen you only have to give compression at that time the rate of the compression will be 100 per minute so both of these are questions which are which are asked understood yes ma'am then uh, ensure manual displacement of the uterus and lateral tilt at every step you have to do uh, ensure that because chest compressions are not as effective after 20 weeks of gestation so uh, you can uh, you can uh, Uh, go for early uh, like uh, early recourse to the delivery of the fetus so after 20 weeks even if it is 21 22 then there are chances there are less chances that the fetus will survive but you are doing uh, you are doing this uh, this is also called as perimortem cesarean section you are doing this to save the life of the mother there are two advantages of doing this perimortem cesarean section where you deliver the baby on site you do not ship the patient to ot on the side where uh, the resuscitation is being taken place only with a scalpel you give an incision you deliver the baby and after that you you just put the clamp and leave it there okay you do not do anything else apart from that you do not close also and there is and uh, the risk of bleeding in these cases is lo- less because the patient is already in shock so you need not worry about the bleeding and this by doing this perimortem cesarean section there are two things one this compression on the uterus will be relieved which was compressing the aorta and the major vessel second you can do an internal chest compression which is more effective so that's why that so that's why a perimortem cesarean section and this is one thing that you should remember it is done for the mother for the survival of the mother and not the baby and the baby is never a pri- priority in cases of maternal collapse so these are something that, that you have to remember then uh, mouth to mouth you give it only if uh, airway agents are not available otherwise you always give it using bag and mask two attempts at ventilation to minimize the uh, interruption of chest compression so that i've already told the rate is 30 is to 2 so after cpr all uh, you have to assess like you have given cpr one set and then you have to ass- uh, ass- attach a defibrillator and assess the rhythm so uh, again this is another important uh, question that when will you give the patient shock so there are only two shockable rhythms one is ventricular fibrillation and other is pulseless ventricular tachycardia so only in these two cases you will give shock if other things like asystole and pea that is uh, pulseless electronic activity in this case you will not give the shock only in these two cases ventricular fibrillation and pulseless vt you give shock and how, uh, uh, and how much shock do you give you give one shock if it is if your machine is biphasic then you give it at uh, 200 joules if it is monophasic you give 360 joules and then again you continue the cpr for 2 minutes and then again assess rhythm okay if it is non shockable that is if it is asystole or pea then you again continue the cpr for 2 minutes and then you assess for the rhythm if it becomes shockable then you give the shock otherwise you can keep on continuing cpr okay and during cpr you have to establish iv access give high flow oxygen intubate and then give continuous chest compression correct the reversible causes give adrenaline every 3 to 5 minutes and consider amiodarone atropine and magnesium and these causes i have already told you about the causes of uh, collapse the mnemonic is the so four t's four x and there is one e also that is eclampsia okay Yes, Understood till now. This table yes. was very important. Yes, ma'am. Then uh, relieving aorto cable compression. So this is how you do manual displacement. You can do it with two hands or you can do it with one hand. You try to deviate the uterus. So manual di- displacement of the uterus or lateral tilt at 15 to 30 degree on a firm surface to the left should be done. Lateral tilt can also be achieved on a tilting operated uh, table with a solid wedge. of an appropriate size and spinal board 
then uh, supraglottic devices this i've already told that they should not be used ideally you should be using for intubation and uh, cuffed endotracheal dress because pregnant females they are at risk of increased um, aspiration and endotracheal cuffed endotracheal tube is preferred why this is happening because of the physiological changes in airway such as hyperemia hypersecretion and edema which lead to increased fragility of the airway mucosa causing bleeding and difficulties in visualization during intubation so uh, then coming over to chest compression so i told you you have to do 30 compression followed by two rescue breaths and uh, how how you have to do, give the chest compression the position of the hand should be on the center of the chest and uh, you have to uh, the direction should be perpendicular to the chest wall you have to go 5 to 6 cm deep and the rate is 30 to uh, 30 is to 2 post intubation the rate should be 100 to 120 per minute after intubation i have told you that desynchronized ratio because the intubator is providing the this thing uh breath so you just have to concentrate on the uh, uh chest compression then the rate is 100 to 120 per minute 100 per minute is something that you have to remember then about chest compressions in uh, adults children and infants in adults you give it with both both hands and the rate you press it 2 inches down 5 to 6 cm i told you and the rate is 30 is to 2 or desynchronized 100 to 120 per minute for children aged 1 to 8 you have to do it with just one hand and you have to push 2 inches down in infants you have to do it just with two fingers and 1.5 because their ribs are fragile and you have to uh, press only 1.5 inches down okay then this is just a repeat because this question are asked so i just put it again rate of chest compression before intubation it is 30 uh, uh, chest compression is to two breaths after intubation ratio of the chest compression to ventilation should be desynchronized ventilation should uh, should be at the rate of 10 breaths per minute which is given by the intubator and continuous you have to do continuous chest compression at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute understood yes ma'am Okay. and do you have a picture of cuff tube ma'am pictures of what cuff tube you said cuff tube ha uh, it has a cuff i'll i can show it on google it has a cuff attached to it which you inflate it with air so see so this is an uncuffed where there is here there is a cuff which you inflate which seals the airway so that the contents from the esophagus don't go into airway so this you inflate it with the air okay this is cuffed this is uncuffed where okay. there is no okay nowadays okay. we are not using uncuffed tube we are using only cuffed tube for ga they we use it no ma'am sorry for general anesthesia also we are using cuff doll only nowadays we are not using okay. cuff okay so then this is the cuff yeah this is ah, yes i got it got it okay thank you ma'am okay then a uh, defibrillator so how do you use the defibrillator first you turn on the device then you expose uh, expose the patient's bare chest including bra you apply two electrodes so there are two adhesive pads which are applied red uh, red and blue on the person's dry skin after that you assess for the rhythm make sure if the patient if it is shockable then only you give the shock shockable are only to ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ct then you decide for the shock, shock and you uh, make sure that you ask the patient to uh, all away you ask so that everybody gets away and no one touches the person as ad delivers the uh, defibrillation shock and continue hand, once you give, have given the shock you again give cpr for 2 minutes okay and then again you assess the rhythm the same setting should be used in a pregnant female as in a non pregnant uh, adult as there is no change in thoracic impedance a decent defibrillator pads are preferable to the defibrillator pa- paddles so you preferably use pads rather than paddles else and the left pad should be applied lateral to the left breast okay 
then uh, a defibrillation you always assess rhythm if it is shockable i told you shockable are two uh, ventricular fibrillation and pulseless vt you give a shock you give only one shock at a time how much do you give 200 joules by if it's biphasic if it's monophasic 300 360 joules and then after that you continue cpr for 2 minutes and again assess rhythm if it is non shockable that is a systole or pulseless electrical activity then you immediately uh, you again switch you do not give a shock you uh, give cpr for 2 minutes and assess rhythm okay understood yes ma'am okay then when should you discontinue the resuscitation so uh, like if you have done the resuscitation and the patient is not responding you have done it for a long time cpr is also given you have given the shock also but the patient has not responded so when do you decide you have to de- uh, discontinue so the decision should only be made by consultant obstetrician and consist- consultant ap- uh, anesthetist to discontinue the resuscitation efforts and it should be in consensus with the cardiac arrest team so you have to take an opinion from them before discontinuing or uh, otherwise until then you have to continue cpr understood yes ma'am okay ma'am then, right line in ecg sorry straight sub in no, ecg monitor even if it's a straight line you continue to resuscitate okay okay until the uh, uh, it has been told by consultant obstetrician or consultant anesthetist with the cardiac arrest team to discontinue then okay. this question option c Oh, here, don't have... Option C. Any Option other? D. Yes, it. Because we are saving the mother only. Yeah. So you need not check for uh, fetal viability. So perimortem cesarean section is a very, very, very important topic. You get questions almost every year on this topic. So uh, I'll just uh, go through the options. One, if an epidural is not cited earlier, general anesthesia is used. So this is wrong. You do it without anesthesia. you do it you need not shift the patient to ot you do it at the place where the resuscitation is being taken place whether it is in the ground or whether it is in the uh, ambulance or whether it is in the uh, ward so you do it there and you just use a scalpel and the clamps to clamp the cord you just deliver the baby and leave it there you do not keep go on resuturing okay so you do, uh, do not require any anesthesia for that because patient is collapsed she will not have any pain the patient must be immediately shifted to the nearest emergency operating theater no this i have already told you have to do it at the place where resuscitation is being taken place the procedure must be done within 5 minutes of collapse this is true it should be done within 5 minutes the decision to perform perimortem cesarean section should be made within 4 minutes of resuscitation okay within 4 minutes you should decide whether you have to do or not do once you have made the decision within 1 minute you should complete it so within 5 minutes in total you have to do the five within five minutes of total of collapse you have to complete the resuscitation okay but you need not check for fetal viability because that mm. is our priority there is no need to check for fetal viability this is true when resuscitation is going the procedure should be deferred no you have to do it in between of the resuscitation okay it's a nice question actually yeah so this is how this i have already explained all the points okay so the decision should be this is an important point because you get they try to confuse you they give you two kinds of question first one is the decision for uh, perimortem cesarean section should be done uh, should be uh, made in how many minutes so then your answer will be 4 minutes and the second question is uh, the perimortem cesarean section should be performed within how, how many minutes of class then your answer will five. be 5 minutes, five minutes. your aim should be delivered to deliver the fetus and placenta within 1 minute 1 minute okay then perimort a uh, little bit more details about uh, perimortem cesarean section in a woman over 20 weeks of gestation if there is no response to uh, correctly performed cpr within 4 minutes of maternal collapse 
or if resuscitation has continued beyond this then perimortem uh, cesarean section should be undertaken to assess maternal resuscitation and uh, uh, pregnant when, person, when it is before uh, within 5 minutes and when it is uh, within 4 minutes so the decision to perform perimortem cesarean section is within 4 minutes and it should be performed within 5 minutes so only 1 minute you have to perform the cesarean perimortem cesarean okay okay so um, a pregnant women becomes hypoxic more quickly than non pregnant women and irreversible brain damage can ensue within 4 to 6 minutes so that's why this criteria of 5 minutes is there and it is also called as resuscitative hysterectomy the uh, then it should be performed where the collapse has occurred and resuscitation has been taken place the operator should use the incision which will facilitate the most rapid access so this is also another question what kind of incision will you give you will give a vertical incision here okay ideally midline vertical or supra pubic whichever you are comfortable in okay so midline vertical is usually faster a scalpel and a umbilical cord clamps only two things you need here or alternative ligature should be available on the resuscitation trolley in all areas where maternal collapse may occur closure is not required as bleeding is minimal then what are the advantages of doing perimortem cesarean section closure is not required because you at have to that, focus on the research time. at that time you need not once the patient is awake then you can shut the patient and do out of oti and do closure okay okay so yeah, yeah, not immediately okay because you just have one minute for that then what are the advantages of doing perimortem cesarean section the gravid uterus it impedes the venous return and thus reduces the cardiac output by approximately 60% secondary to aorto cable compression so delivery of the fetus in the placenta it reduces oxygen consumption improves the venous return and the cardiac output it facilitates internal chest compression and makes ventilation easier it also allows for internal chest compression by inserting the hand through the open uh, abdomen up to the diaphragm and compressing the posterior aspect of the heart against the chest wall this improves the cardiac output beyond that is achieved in closed chest compression okay yes ma'am yes ma'am okay so at less than 20 weeks of gestation there is no proven benefit from delivery of the fetus and the placenta uh perimortem cesarean section should be considered as a resuscitative procedure to be uh, performed primarily in inter interest of maternal survival if maternal resuscitation is continuing beyond 4 minutes of collapse delivery of the fetus and placenta should be performed as soon as possible to aid this even if the fetus is already dead and uh, it has been seen after perimortem cesarean section 69% rate of infant survival is performed is seen if it is performed within 5 minutes So this is again one of the questions. So up to seventy percent can infants also survive. Okay. If perimortem, uh, suppose you have done per, uh, perimortem uh, cesarean section also, everything you have done and it is an unsuccessful resuscitation, then what will you do? Uh, that is, patient is uh, has not revived. Then the case has to be discussed with coroner or procurator. fiscal to uh, determine whether a postmortem has to be performed before any medical devices such as lines and endotracheal tube are removed as per rcog recommendation so this is also one of the question they ask you question like this that uh, the re, uh, you have done uh, you've done all the resuscitative measures and even perimortem cesarean section has been done but you fail to revive the patient so what will you do next so they give options you will remove uh, you will uh, close the uterus you will remove all the lines and hand over the patient to the body so uh, or you will leave everything as it is and you will not touch anything you will not remove the endotracheal tube you will not remove the lines you will keep all iv lines in place you will uh, leave the patient like leave the abdomen open only and you have to inform the coroner so that is the answer okay so you don't have to do anything if you are not able to revive you are stopping the resuscitation there you have to leave the patient there and then uh, as it is you don't have to remove the lines or cover the patient or do anything only the coroner will come they will examine the patient and they will decide what to do next so this is one of the question okay you have to see the patient as such yeah all the lines all the tubes if the you will not remove the like you will not remove the placenta you will not close the uterus you will not do anything you will leave the patient as it is okay and what about the 
fetus mom even if it is before 24 weeks it will not be possible right if we, like if uh, after 20 weeks i told you uh, they have seen that survival if it is done within five minutes around 70 percent survival if, is sup mm, if suppose the baby is alive uh, we'll resuscitate it otherwise we don't uh -huh. Any day you give it to the neonatologist after taking out. Okay. If at all it's if it's viable. Hmm. Yeah. No, no. You like only the neonatologist uh, declare whether the patient is uh, the baby is dead or not. So you always give it to the neonatologist. They will try to resuscitate the baby. If they fail, like we are doing the maternal resuscitation. If they fail, then they will declare on their end. Okay. Okay, so if the patient is alive, yes, then you continue the underlying uh, cause of the collapse, transfer them to the high HDO or the critical care. Okay, if she's alive. If the patient is not alive, you leave the patient as it is and inform coroner, procurator, fiscal and inform embrace about it. Because you have to all uh, like maternal mo mortality have to be uh, documented and reported to embrace. Then you should ensure that each and every step of resuscitation, you have written it. Documentation should be uh, done, whether the patient is alive or not alive. You have to debrief the patient if the patient is alive and the relatives. Okay. Other even you have to debrief the entire staff because it's a traumatic experience. Um, so also staff support and debriefing should be done and review the case through clinical governance process. And then the case has to be reviewed. So this is how post collapse management is done. Understood? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Doing this question. Induced a two weeks post collapse. Yen, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. You're attempting, Dr. Gori? Yes, ma'am. Ah, tell me, what is your answer? Yen, yen, I said, yen. N. Okay. Or, or, ye. Call for help. It should be call for help. The first step is always in resuscitation. Call for help. Call for help. Okay, so the answer is call for help. Then next question. M. M. Yes, very good. It should be M. So, uh, see, first step is always call for help. Second is A, B, C, D, E. So, uh, here in this, the patient uh, probably help has already been called because the patient is being shifted to the hospital. Okay. So that means uh, patient is already reaching at the site. After that, what we after uh, call for help, the second step is you secure the airway, you assess breathing circulation. So the answer should be M here. The next question. Yes, ma'am. What, what? Yes. If. Yes, you have to do supportive care. 
so because here first is call for help a b c d e because here resuscitation is already done so that means a b c d e is done and now she is re revived now you are planning to transfer her to the hospital so where will you transfer you will transfer her to high dependency unit you will give hydration and give care and treat the cause of collapse whatever it is okay then this question this so you can just guess what it d d to 50% d d it is c 30 to 40 okay so auto cable compression so auto cable compression it significantly reduces cardiac output from 20 weeks of gestation onwards and the efficiency of the chest compression during resuscitation and uh, gravid uterus why this occurs it uh, basically gravid uterus it reduces the venous return and supine position as a consequence cardiac output is reduced by 30 to 40 percent how can you man uh, prepare prevent it it can be reversed by turning the patient to left lateral position then um this was about the collapse then after uh, like uh, post collapse what all you should do clean what are the clinical governance uh, points you have to ensure adequate uh, documentation which is essential for all maternal collapse cases whether or not resuscitation was successful and you have to do an incident reporting for these cases so this is also this is important where you have to do also there are many other uh, things which i'll be telling you in future like there is shoulder dystocia where again you have to do an incident reporting you have to prepare a incident report so all cases of maternal collapse should generate a clinical incident form and the care should be reviewed through the clinical governance process all cases of maternal death they should have to be reported to embrace uk okay 